Typically, I can do this without a mic, but the room is so big. <laughs> you, you, it feels like you're an ocean apart for me. It's like when I say to my fiance in a king size bed years ago, I said, there's an ocean between us. What's wrong here? <laughs> but uh, being a single mom of three children and four grandkids, because I am a cookum now and very proud um, of my ancestry, my name's Winona Lafrenier. That's my English side. My cookum was uh, from South Dakota, migrated to Manitoba, and married my grandfather, who is French from Quebec. So I've got my mother's first name and my grandfather's. But in, in spirit, when we're born, we're, we're born with an earth name. So Uzawan, now Kwe, Kizisi Kwe Dijnikas. That's the Ojikri version of my name. And it means high noon woman. So the sun at its highest peak is the strongest part of my day. So there's not one day that goes by on this, my life on earth, where I don't acknowledge the rising of that sun and the setting of it in midday and it going around the, the globe at night. So acknowledging those spirits is very critical in our communities. And, you know, just being in the room today with, with all of you enthusiastic about learning a little bit about our knowledge. And I tell people I know nothing and I understand even less. That's the humble side of me. And it's so true because the more I go out there and explore the, this world and travel, talk to people, spend time with the animals, observe nature, I realize that, that I know nothing. And so by saying that, that's the, the, the wolf teaching when we talk about humility. And, and I, I try to, you know, pride myself because there's times when I'm ashamed of that, that history. It's, I'm not ashamed of who I am. I'm ashamed of the history. Um, but people need to learn that. That's all part of that, you know, that, that bridging, that future. And we're going to do it through education, through awareness you know, through welcoming you into our communities to join us in ceremony, taking you out on the land, because that's what this is all about. This is all about Mother Earth, and that's why we're here. We're looking for, some, for alternative to solutions to our, our life on this planet, and they are there. But you have to talk to the right people, and even more so, listen. We were given two of these for a reason, and one of this. So, what I, I, I've introduced myself, and I want to pass it over to my sister, Carol, whom I've got to know now for a few years. And it, I have to say, it's, I look at everybody in this room like an equal partner, like my brother, my sister. We're all relatives, right? And that's what our, our planet wants us to recognize. When are you going to stand up and, and, and say, yes, we're all one? So act like it, right? Um, and so I'm going to pass it over quickly just for Carol to introduce herself and then we'll get right into the presentation. Sure. I'll, I'll just say I'm so happy to be here. Uh, my name is Carol Crow. I'm uh, Algonquin. I'm Anishinaabe from uh, Pickwocknagon from Ontario. Um, but I live at Christopher Lake. I always say I live where the boreal forest meets the plains. I'm married to a plains Ojibwe from Kakuishtahal. Uh, First Nations in southern Saskatchewan, so, so we live in a pretty magical place. And uh, like you, Winona, I was gifted a, ga a name, um, an, an Indian name from a ceremony from the rain dance many years at Nick and Eat, uh, um, taking our kids there for ceremony. And uh, my Indian name is Kapinokosit, which is Cree for something coming. And uh, it resonates for me because um, we also have a, a strong connection to the dream world and that's a place where we can see lots of things that are going to be happening in the future. Um, we're all connected in a, in a special way, and, and those gifts um, are so important. I remember Martin Brokenleg at a session I was at many years ago said, you know, don't think your culture's gone. You can still, you can still access it through the dream world, and it's true. So uh, I, I embrace my name very much because it's, it's, it's a, you know, a spirit name that I carry very closely to my heart. And, not something you always share. So I'm so happy to see everybody in a circle here today. And, and thank you for being here. Thank, 
thank you to each of you. I wish we had time that I could <laughs> shake everybody's hands and say hello and get to know you all, but the connection is here and I'm happy that we're going to be able to share uh, with you our knowledge and, and our experience and, and our thoughts, but also we want you to get to know each other as well through this. So I guess in saying that, follow up to Carol's um, introduction, these are some of the common guiding circle principles because we're in circle today and for obvious reasons, we live in a circular economy. You know, we believe our, our medicine wheel speaks to this, like the four elements of life, the four races of man, the four seasons, right? So there's many teachings that, that come with being an indigenous woman uh, and knowing our roles growing up um, and being raised with some of these principles. So in circle, when you see um, our mainstream, our Western, brothers and sisters talking and setting the stage and talking about house rules. These are some of ours, right? And they're, they're very, it speaks to the heart more so than, than the mind because the longest journey you're gonna ever have is from here to here in life, in this life. So you can script out what you're gonna say here, but when the heart starts to speak and wants to say something, it's gonna take over in, in seconds, in milliseconds. So these are just some of the guiding principles that we use throughout the session because everybody here in the room has wisdom, right? And, and it's important that we respect those, those opinions or those perspectives. And, and we call it wisdom. That's the teaching from the beaver. And I heard the, te the Eco Canada team talking about the beaver in the, in, the, in the room earlier and there's just so much that goes into that teaching of the beaver. So you could spend weeks learning about that one animal. And, and in our medicine wheel teachings, there's over 300 that I, could, that I was taught before you even get to that elderhood, which I'm preparing myself for now. But that takes time. And it's not something you self-proclaim in a community. Um, it, it's something that you'll know when it happens, right? And people you'll see them self-identify. And that's not the right way either. Um, but I just want you to, I guess, listen with intent, good intent, um, and be respectful of your, your peers. And, and I know this is, when you have environmental enthusiasts in a room, it, it's almost an innate characteristic of people who work with the land, because it teaches you about respect. It teaches you about love. It teaches you about a humility, about courage, about truth. So. With that, what I want to uh, share a little bit about, and I, I did mention, of course, where I'm from, Treaty 4 uh, territory from Menegazibi and Anishinaabe. Um, I think that web of identity is really critical and knowing who you are, where you come from, and your future. My mother at the bottom left, um, she was a country singer. She used to sing alongside Kitty Wells, if any of you know Patsy Cline and, <laughs> and, and those, nice. right? So. Um, she used to compete, but then when she met my father, she obviously, her, her life took a, a huge shift and she had seven children. So that ended her music career, and, but nonetheless, she's grateful for, you know, the, the future and, and what it has to hold. Because now I get to carry that knowledge down to my children. And, and my cookum was the one who actually raised me. She rescued me from despair when I had gone through a lot of sexual violence in the home because I grew up with alcohol parents, right? I mean, alcoholism and it's tough when they've both gone to a school system and have been abused. It's gonna, abuse is gonna breed abuse, right? So in a lot of ways, it's difficult for our people to get over and we're still dealing with the side effects of it. But for myself, I said, to my, my cookum, I said, I'll be damned if I, my kids are gonna be oppressed. I had to break that cycle. So I've re refrained from drugs and alcohol all my life so I can work with these sacred medicines, right? Not a lot of people have that gift. You have to spend a lot of time. So even a simple plant, my cookum would take me out for a whole year to study that plant before I was even allowed to touch it, right? And then it's gonna teach you and then you're gonna, you know, and I work with 52 different natural herbs now that I harvest right across the Western Boreal Forest. So um, I, I heal my own, right? And my children and my family members. 
And through this, this connection that we have with our ancestors, it's vital and important that we carry on those, those teachings to our, our young. I've got two of my children that are taking on, um, I guess, my role, and it's, and it's good. Because I'm the only one of 200 grandchildren that took this, this role on with my cookum. So it's, um, we never relinquished that connection. We never did. We never surrendered our, our rights, those types of things. You hear a lot of that in the media. You hear a lot about that you know, in, in our communities. Um, and going forward, that's you know, something I, I'm going to carry um, right to my last, my last day. Um, in, in body form. And with that, I'm, you know, I'm going to hand it over to my sister Carol to share a little bit more about, you know, her life story and this is the reason we do what we do. Right? I find that so amazing when you go into most places and you ask, what do you do or what, mm. what's your life like? And we, we tend to start in that place of family and you know, how many kids you got, who's your mom, who's your dad, you know, where are you from. Um, these pictures that I'm sharing today are, are, are quite significant. I have two adult children and two grandchildren that I'm blessed with. Um, there's a picture there in the center of my, of my husband. Um, I'm a wildlife photographer. I love taking, taking pictures. And we were out um, near Prince Albert Park uh, one day. And, I said to him, you know, I'd really like to see some like little ravens or little birds. He goes, hang on, we'll find some. And uh, he could tell just from the trees that, that there was some parents calling for the ravens. He said, I'll get you some pictures of, of some young ravens. We pulled over, he came out of the bush or you know, out of the grass and he's holding these two little ravens. And so I had an opportunity to take quite, quite a few photos of him, but I, I was feeling kind of bad. Okay, better leave them alone. He goes, they'll be fine. And they did, they went back. and and um, did their fledgling thing, wandered around while their parents called them. Um, but wildlife has been a big uh, deal in my life. Um, I come from a family of, of um, you know, and in addition to the connection, we always seem to have a role. Mm -hmm. And my family's had this role of wildlife recovery. It's just been in, in all aspects, and I'm, on the next slide I'll share in a minute. But So my kids grew up with that. And the one picture up in the uh, left is... Uh, is Ling Ling. That's a little uh, Canada goose that my daughter found floating uh, one spring in the water with um, fishing net all wrapped around its, its beak. Mm. And it was cut right into it and it was just laying there waiting to die. And my daughter brought that, you know, little goose home. Um, even though it's illegal to do that, I did call one of my f conservation friends and said, what should we feed him? <laughs> and he said, don't tell anybody, I'm going to tell you what to feed him. <laughs> and uh, so we, we only kept him for a couple of weeks and it turned out to be a girl, but Ling Ling um, changed our life because my daughter, that little bird would sit underneath her at night while she was reading to it. And if anybody came near it, and I don't know if you've ever seen the tongue of a, of a Canada goose, but it's pretty cool. And they, they hiss at you and that little goose would hiss at all of us except her. So she was its mama and uh, that's, uh, we went to the Saskatoon um, veterinarian clinic which they take wildlife um, at the university there. And so it was um, sent off with another little gosling and she was just thrilled about that. But you know, it's been a big part of our life. That's even a raven that we, uh, I seen walking around my neighborhood for all morning and I thought something's wrong with it and it had, a, it had an injured wing but it wasn't broken so we got it home, got it better and then let it go. Um, there's a picture of my son there. Uh, I do, I'm going to talk a little bit later about the bear environmental monitor training that I do um, but my son happens to be a survival instructor. Um, my husband taught him how to survive on the land so it's, it was simple for him to go into you know, wilderness first aid and take on this amazing role as a survival instructor. So he does that today. And uh, we're always out in the bush. So it's a very big part of our life. And I, like you said, it's, yeah. oh, it's wonderful. But without an environmental role model, boy, oh boy, my next slide here that I want to share with you is speaking about the beaver, um, my uh, auntie uh, stopped the inhumane trapping of beaver in Canada. And her name is Gertrude Bernard. Um, she's um, passed on now. Um, but she 
was married to uh, infamous or famous, whatever you want to look at it, um, Grey Owl. And we're actually doing a film. Uh, I have a little trailer right now that we're working on because we want to bring and raise the awareness how important that beaver is. That's our true water protector. That's the one that tells us that there's something wrong with the water. I've learned so much about uh, beaver ecology the last 10 years of my life all over the world. Um, so both of them have been real role models in encouraging me to do the work that I do. And, and I'm always thinking about how can we you know, make a difference. And uh, I think everybody should have a, a, an environmental role model in human form and in either plant form or, or some animal that you just gravitate and you probably all do have some, some favorite one out there. Mine is the otter because I'm otterly amazing. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good Anyways. one. <laughs> So now that we've talked a little bit about who we are, like there's a lot more to, of course, right? We just wanted to, I guess, put some perspective into, you know, what brings us here today. So what we would like to do is, uh, you know, take five minutes. You know, it's about getting to know every, you're not gonna get to know everybody in a room, but, you know, ask yourself these two questions. Right? What is one thing you want to learn about this afternoon? Right? And hopefully we're going to touch on that and just park that for, for a second. And what is a cause or a purpose you deeply believe in? And if you pick someone that you don't know in the room, and have, we'll give you five minutes to have that conversation, and then we'll come back to our seats and we're going to start into the uh, an, an important ceremonial teaching that we were gifted, um, both Carol and I, and a numerous other people across Turtle Island. Um, just to illustrate, when you participate in ceremony, this is what it's like, right? Um, we don't force our knowledge or cultural ways on folks, but we welcome you to participate, because when you go to community, you're gonna see a lot of that type of thing. Like we smudge when we, before we bring the dancers out in a circle at a powwow, or we have a pipe that opens up our, our conferences, right? And some of you might be already, you know, really engaged in that, in those processes and in those protocols in our community and we really respect you and honor, honor you for that. So, but take five minutes and just talk amongst, right, the group. Go and talk to one person or two, if you can get through two in five minutes. We often usually don't, right? <laughs> you just have so much to, to share, and uh, we want to honor that, that, that way of opening up for you, too. So it just gets you up, because we know you just ate, and we don't want you falling asleep. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, five minutes. And feel free, to, it could be this person beside you, stand up, move around, Take whatever. Take a stretch. So thank you everybody for that. Um, we're just going to get back to the, the program and So I just want to say miigwech for, you know, for, for sharing. I don't know if any of you know, um, you know, when I was young growing up, I used to read a lot of Mark Twain because I grew up in the 60s and I read a couple of his quotes and one really stuck with me. And when he said this, I, I already knew what my purpose was. But he said the two most important days in your life is the day you're born and, day, and the day you figure out why. And that's your purpose. That's why we wanted you to have this conversation to talk about what cause or purpose you deeply believe in because a lot of that is linked to to that purpose and the day you were born and this is why you're here doing this work and that might change over time but you're always going to revert back because I tried I went to work in the oil and gas I went to work in government but I always defaulted back to working with in a role where I get to be on the land during COVID I spent more time on the land than I did around people. And that taught me a lot. I, I just needed that time to go in and, you know, replenish and refresh and be one and connected with our mother because she's speaking to us through 
all the tragedies and traumas and crises you see around a planet. When you see the fires, she's smudging her body, right? Much like we're going to demonstrate today. When you see a flood, she's flooding her wounds because she's wounded. And when you see that polar ice melt, you know what that does. And to us as Indigenous people, that's danger zone because th that's where you start seeing our ocean levels rise. And I talked to a researcher who's worked and lived in the Arctic for 25 years. And I won't tell you what he told me because I have this conversation with him every five years. Because every five years, you, 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 you know, there's new research that comes on stream all the time and says a, a bunch of different things. But as Indigenous people, we don't live based on that. We live based on what our mother is telling us when we're out on the land. When we see a tumor growing in a moose or a deer, we know our land is contaminated, right? And so we have to look at all of these things and take them into consideration when we see it happen. I won't eat any fish from the lakes here because the mercury levels are too high. I just won't. But I'll, I'll eat fish from Manitoba, from my home, because we get our water tested. We don't have dams near our territory because we're a little f further north. But, you know, we, we monitor that. We don't need tools and science to tell us what's happening to the land or the planet. Um, so what I'm going to demonstrate, where's my clicker? I put it down here, <laughs> is the smudge ceremony. And it is an ancient practice. It's been around for, for a long time. There are indigenous cultures around the globe smudge with different medicines and have a different way even when I go to places like Africa or China, you see it's very similar in practice. In principle, it's similar. Um, or when you go to church, when you see the priest with the incense, right? Everybody has a way to, to take that time to cleanse that mind, body, spirit, right? And we rely so heavily on these medicines to help us to do that. They're tools to help us to heal not only ourselves, but our planet and, and vice versa. So, and, and the way it's typically done, I don't know how many of you have attended a smudge ceremony, if I could get a show of hands, just to kind of get an idea. So, yeah, between, I guess, a third and a half of you. That's great. So, <laughs> yeah, so you can see the impact that that's having with that knowledge. And five years from now, and I walk into a room and ask the same question, it's going to be closer to 100 people in a room if you've ever had any engagement with Indigenous folks, because this is how we open our day. I smudge every morning. Before my plant, my feet even plant hit the floor, I'm in prayer. I'm saying, Creator, thank you for that first breath of air that you're giving to me. Right? So it's that, that gratitude and those seven, right, those teachings that we're reminded of every day. And so it's, there are a number of medicines that individuals use. Where I come from, we use the prairie sage, and sometimes we alternate with, um, with the sweet grass, right? And I, I find the willow fungus is a predominant. Uh, smudge for the Cree up in, in the north. So And a medicine we use. Yes. So, and, I, and in the south, what they do is they take the coals and they burn the sweet grass on the coals. That's how the Blackfoot do it. So everybody, we have to honor different ways. Um, and so when we're smudging, we're conducting a ceremony. You're a part of a ceremony. And that's why I'm wearing my ribbon skirt because that's, I don't go anywhere in ceremony without it. Um, and so we, it's to purify any negative thoughts or energy you carry. Because if you picture this, you, you all live in a conventional home, and you have people that walk in there. You don't know what energy they're bringing into your home. You don't. And there's scientific evidence and proof of the prairie sage that it removes bacteria and obviously negative energy, because if you watch any of these uh, ghost whisper type reality shows, because my daughter's so much, in, she's into that, right? Um, 
they use that sage. They use different forms of smudge to clear that energy or to release that spirit. So when a person passes on in our community and they die, we immediately start up a fire for four days. That's, according to our beliefs, it takes four days for that spirit to transition from the physical world into the spiritual world. And that's why we do that fire. But the fire also brings people together, right? It, it, it brings you together to talk and reminisce and laugh and cry, do what you need to do to mourn the spirit and feed the spirit of that fire because that's your family member. It, it's representing that. So you take care of that fire. You don't let it go out for four days. You gotta have people there at two, three o'clock in the morning to keep that flame going, right? So those are just a few little things that you know, I wanted to, to bring today, you know, that talk about some of these ceremonies, if you've ever witnessed them or been part of them, it's, it's very, for me, it's very harmonizing. It's, it's very natural. And, and that's what I love about, you know, having a circle like this. And if you don't want to participate for whatever reason, and, and this is a medicine you can smudge, like for women who are on their, their moon time, that's how we reference it, it's because my cycle follows the moon cycle. Um, it's, it is allowed. The only time is when, you know, there's a sun dance or a sweat lodge or a vision quest. You got to wait, right? You got to wait in between. Um, but if you want to refrain from participating, all I ask you to do is put both your hands on your heart. So this way I know, right? But at the same time, and, and don't feel obligated because again, we don't want to inflict our, everybody has a way of, but it, I guess the message I want to bring is you're honoring our culture by doing that. You're honoring the grandfathers and grandmothers, the spirit of these medicines. You're honoring creation. Because once we light this, this medicine up, we're bringing the spirit and life of this medicine into the room. We're, we're essentially bringing life to it when we're burning. And we're in prayer the whole time. So when I come to you with the smudge, pray in your own way. And I can demonstrate it with Carol, how it's done. There's no right or wrong way. There's no judgment. It's outside that door, right? We left it outside the door. So it's, it's whatever you're comfortable with and your comfort level with, with the smudging. Um, and so I'm going to pass it on to Carol if you wanted to add anything to the smudge with, in terms of your experience and some, anything that you've observed and to add to the... I, I was actually thinking about all our bear programs mm -hmm. with the students. It doesn't matter what community I'm in, every morning we smudge. It's just the way we start our day. And I work with a few um, Indigenous consultants and we'll be in a really stressful pitch or something and they'll go, oh, I gotta go smudge. <laughs> and it's like, you know that they just wanna get grounded and feel comfortable and be able to you know, share. And, and the other part, you know, that, that fire you're to talking about, that home fire is so sacred, so important. That's one of our first teachings. That's what we teach our children first, how to take care of yourself. It starts with your fire because that smoke is so sacred. That's what takes our prayers to the Creator. And so thank you for sharing all of this. Yeah, I, I guess to add to that, just before we, we, we go into it, one of the things we do as Indigenous people, before we launch an, a program through an institution, we go to our elders, we, we ask them to do a ceremony. We have to get that okay by the spirit world to conduct this one year program. So we go to the elders across Alberta, like I might pick one or two in North and South to conduct a pipe ceremony prior to rolling out this environmental monitoring and drone program, because that's how we need to we need to integrate that into our programming. So then I've had one program where they have said, no, this is not good for our people. We have to get that approval from our chiefs because we have all our chiefs are board of directors at Indian Resource Council. And if we don't do things and follow those protocols, we're going to get our little hands slapped, right? Or we're going to get reminded that, no, we need to go back. Um, and so we, we, in, we invite an elder to come in and do pipe. They do drum, they do song, they do the smudge, and then we do a feast with all our partners 
We bring government and all our, our industry partners, our students, the staff of YTC, and then we, we feast that day. And that's what kicks off our programming. And that's so important because if we go through the program and we have all these hiccups and challenges, we know why. Because we did not do it right from the beginning. <clears throat> so that's one practice that we've definitely adopted into our, our ways and our practice, like through the office every day. My CEO, Stephen Buffalo, he's got the seed or the sweet grass and smudging even before. And I asked him, why do you do that every day? He says, because that's where I'm most vulnerable. Isn't that the truth, though? Right? So we made it a daily practice at work to, to incorporate that, that smudge. So with that, I, if anybody have any questions about it, any curiosity, any, anybody brave enough to ask? <laughs> <laughs> There's no wrong answer, no wrong question, or, yeah. I think they're ready to smudge. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> So, yes, so what happens is when we light the sage and I roll it up into a small little ball and she's got extra there because I'm going to need more than that. Um, so once we light it, we don't touch the medicine, right? So we, we use the feather, right? And a lot of times what I do and people will ask me to smudge the back because you've heard the term stab in the back, right? So when I cleanse, I often do the back. Yeah, sometimes the And what happens is when you're brushing, this feather will start to split. But when you, when you smudge them down, and then you shake off, and then you go to the next person. But the, the whole point of doing that smudging is to rid that negative energy, because we all carry it. We might not think, right? But it's there. And so that's the whole purpose of having, using the feather, because we don't touch when we, the medicine, right? But I, I touched it to show you what it looks like, right? And um, so, yeah, that, I mean, it's, it's sacred medicine. It comes from a place. Like, we, we have the tobacco when we're out harvesting the medicines, right? And I use organic tobacco when I, when I go and put I don't use the commercial tobacco. It's not healthy for, for our planet. So, um, yeah. And when you're doing an offering, what I was told, if you're going to go and ask an elder to open up a prayer or do a pipe ceremony, you don't need a whole pouch of tobacco. I'm going to say that now because it's, what, $30 plus to buy a pouch. All you need is enough to fit in a pipe bowl. So even a tobacco tie like this is sufficient to go and offer an elder to come in and do it, you know, a talk or, you know, and, and most times if they have to travel, you give them an honorarium, just like any consultant, you ask to come out and do work, you, you, you compensate them the same way. It would be no different because they're bringing all that knowledge to you, right? So just even a small tobacco tie like this would be sufficient. That's how I was taught when you're offering and asking an elder for, to come out and, you know, or a pipe holder to come out, or a knowledge keeper, because they're sharing, like, ancient knowledge with you, right? So that's, you gift them that tobacco when you ask them to come out. So hopefully it's that answered you. It's a contract. Your, it is like a contract, yeah. Yes, I agree. So do you want me to uh, I'm just going to demonstrate. I'll, 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 I'll take off. So... One of the things we do too is we have jewelry. Like I don't, if you have piercings, don't worry about it. I'm not, I'm not gonna, <laughs> but when we smudge and we take our jewelry off because when we come into this, this world, this physical world, we're not, we come into it whole and very pure. So when we smudge with these medicines, we take that metal off because sometimes that could be a barrier because it's a synthetic, right? Um, so, I just removed my whatever I, I could. I mean, I keep my necklace because these are my father's ashes. He passed during COVID, so, and I was, I'm still grieving pretty heavily. Um, so I'm gonna light the smudge and we'll demonstrate how it's done. And then feel free in your own way and, and to be in prayer throughout that. 
and I'd, I'd even invite our, our technicians to participate because um, they do a lot of work um, in a community and they're the ones that are the, in the background don't often get acknowledged I and I don't know if they were even <laughs> right but I just want to say thank you because you helped me to get set up here and um, from my heart I want to say miigwech mm -hmm. so let's light it up I'm going to Sure. So when we smudge this way, I did my mouth so that when I speak, I speak the truth as I know it my eyes so that I can see the beauty of creation and I can smell and listen with good intention and your hair because that's an extension of your soul your arms your legs and just brush it off as best you can and then always last your heart mm. right that's how we smudge and sometimes I have someone do my back because like I said often what happens we don't see and we need to be smudging the whole body not just partial so if you want to Just in case. <laughs> you want to put your arms out, Carol? We like to have a little humor in our lives. <laughs> there we go. There yes. you go. You're welcome. So we're going to go in clockwise direction. Thank you for your patience through that, because that's all about learning to be patient with creation, right? because Mother Earth is with us and we don't, we just let the, the medicine burn out. We don't extinguish the fire. Um, but I wanna say from the top, bottom of my heart, thank you. I love you all for, for being who you are. And yeah, that was, yeah, I got a lot out of that. One of the things I picked up though, there's four people in this room that I picked up some extensive energy from. I don't know if it's good or bad, but usually when that happens, I go talk to those people. Because one gentleman, I did this ceremony in Innisfail for their mayor, their town council, and some community members. And when I went up to the one gentleman, he told me, how did you know that I was dealing with something really heavy was going through a divorce that day so you what happens when you work with these medicines they send you messages and i've been doing this for such a long time that i get asked to go and smudge people's homes because of the negative energy they and, and i've given them the permission to utilize the the medicine to burn afterwards but that's that's we don't know what energy is out there so we do our best to keep that at bay if not try to you know rid those whether they're negative emotions or spiritual or physical um, but I, I always pick up three or four people in the room um, and if there's anything I could do to help um, I'm here for you so and so is my sister Carol we do a lot of this work in in spirit um, of you know our our ancestors and we just want to say thank you for that um, we're not going to talk too much around the you know the, those three pillars 
what we're going to do is we're going to, through our lens, we're going to talk about what ESG is to us. Because, and I know you can read, I'm not going to, you know, go through these slides verbatim. But essentially, this is what you see out there when they're talking environmental, social, governance. These are the three pillars. Um, and we know that ESG is voluntary if you want to participate in it because it's, it's, it's a good thing to do, not mandatory. But when we say here are the global standards, what our people always say is why not go above and beyond those standards to really showcase that you really truly want to do this work in collaboration and partnership with Indigenous people. So when we talk about the environment, we're talking about the actions we take to promote sustainability on the planet. When we talk about the social aspect of these, you know, these performance measures everyone is talking about and investors are, are, are mulling over, we're talking about the actions taken for equality of human life on this planet. And with the governance, we're talking about how we're governed as people. Because prior to uh, European contact, Indigenous people had a beautiful way of life until it was disrupted. We had governance structures. We had all of this, right? And when we see it coming out this way, we go, it's not just about ESG. It's about the I in it too, Indigenous, right? We have our models and our frameworks that come specifically and directly from the land because that's who our teacher is. Our number one teacher is, is the land. So. You know, we're being warned of a lot of the geopolitical tensions and, you know, the, the disruptions and, you know, our governments at a day dealing with a lot of the crises around the world. That has, a, as, that plays a role in the impact and the amount of resources that come to our communities are not because they're so busy with dealing all, with, you know, all these crises globally, like we just experienced one with the pandemic. So when we look at it through our lens, um, there's a fundamental belief, and you can read that. All life is interconnected, and the sacred spiritual connection is reliant on healthy land, animals, waters that sustain us all. So do we protect that way of the past, or do we join in creating a different future? That's what this is asking you. So that's a question I pose to you going forward when you're thinking about the work that you're doing in, you know, on the land or in a community or with indigenous people like because there's a lot of work i think we're just scratching the surface when we're looking at um all that the innovation and creativity that's coming together today um and so when we talk about the global challenges that we're experiencing you know and the impact for all life because we know that it's beyond 1.5 um where do we go from here right and I think we're still struggling to answer that. So as part of the foundation of what we do, and I, and I referenced some of these teachings already previous when I talked about humility and that wolf that brings that teaching and the buffalo respect, um, courage, the bear, right? Our, our bear ceremonies are very powerful. So are our turtle lodges. And, and right across this land, you're gonna come across various ways and, and, and teachings from the Cree, Ojibwe, the Blackfoot, the Dene, the Haudenosaunee and Six Nations, the Nunavut, like there's, there's so many of us, right? So many dialects, so many languages. And I think, you know, bringing it all together and um, talking about these seven sacred natural laws, this is basically our Bible. That's what we follow. That gets drawn and woven into all our, our models in the community. We teach it in our, to our kids in the schools, right? To our young ones. The ones even not yet born, we talk to them while they're in the womb about these teachings. They come into the sweat lodges with us, right? And they're born into ceremony. Um, and so th this is just going to give you a, a, a mini glimpse of some of the teachings that are involved with that medicine wheel. That's a Cree uh, medicine wheel in a center. Only I want to honor that, you know, the Cree in this territory and, and the Blackfoot, of course, we're in Treaty 7, but that's... Uh, you know, the, the colors that are represented on there are, that's a Cree medicine wheel. And when you look at it, you see the four directions. You've got north, east, south, and west. You've got the four colors, four seasons, four races of man. Um, and then, of course, the elements of life, right? The earth, air, water, and fire. If you took one of those elements away, or even if one of those elements were struggling on this planet, what does that do that disrupts the natural cycle of, 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 the, of the planet? And when the planet's disrupted, so are we.
right? So this just kind of gives you an idea. This, I developed this over like 35 years of my life. This is my medicine wheel. Yours might look different from your perspective. Um, and maybe I'll Yeah, and I'll just, I'll just to add to, you know, the, for me, I, I use the medicine wheel quite a bit for a teaching because we are the medicine wheel as individuals as well. You know, we have a physical and mental, a spiritual and emotional. And it's, you've got to go in each of those rooms every day and even do a little sweeping. You're never going to be, you know, that, that quadrant is never going to be completely full. You're always going to be working on it. You're always going to be working on your mental wellness, you know, your emotional wellness, your physical, your spiritual. And sometimes just to, you know, look at each of those quadrants and kind of check, do a check in where you're at. You know, how am I feeling this quadrant? What do I need to do for myself uh, to ground myself, to, to be healthier in this life? And, you know, having a, a long corporate background, you know, that emotional, um, and we all know that, that the emotion was not part of that scenario. It was always the mental, the physical, and the spiritual. And even then, the spiritual was, you know, a very sensitive topic. So now, you know, using the medicine wheel as a way for us all to reflect on, you know, that's, that's the whole of who we are. Mm -hmm. That's how we create somewhat of a balance every day in our lives. We're not always going to be there, though. It, it's a challenge. Yeah. So... Yeah, so, you know, what do we need to know when we're thinking about that, all that ESG and there's a lot of conversation around, let's bridge this, let's braid it, like, what does that mean? And there are two different knowledge systems we're talking about, and actually more than that. So every nation you visit has a knowledge system. Um, but when we look at Western science, we know that, you know, we rely on those environmental indicators and they're changing. If there's any scientists in the room, we're seeing things, they're changing. And we're not seeing those environmental indicators in, in actually the same places. Uh, in fact, I was involved with a project up in northern Saskatchewan and our scientist who at the time was working for the government and was able to change the project. And he was going to look at these environmental indicators for heavy metals um, in certain plants, something that, that's always been done. And, and the elders said, you're looking all in the wrong places. You should be looking at the dragonflies and damselflies. That's where the heavy metals are going to be. And they uh, changed their whole project, focused on that. And of course, that's where the heavy metals were. So the elders you know, have, that, have that knowledge. And, and they, they rely on those spiritual laws, those, those natural laws. And, and they're very dynamic. You know, it's, you're, as you were saying earlier, you know, um, learning the land, we like to think of it as reading the land like a book. Just like you learn something from a book, that's how we're taught to, to read the land. What is it telling you? What are the wildlife telling you? What are the plants telling you? What's the soil telling you? What's the wind telling you? And so when we learn that, we see that interconnection, how everything depends one on the other. And when you start working with elders, and I'm sure many have in here, you start to see how they understand that interconnection. And, you know, so on the science side, I might be working with a hydrologist, a biologist, uh, I'll, you know, list them down, and then the elder who understands all that interconnection that those scientists do. So together, you know, we, we have that, you know, evidence that here's the science saying this is an issue, this is a problem, and then we have the traditional knowledge of saying, yeah, that's what we're seeing, that's what we're reading on the land, that's what we're, we're interpreting. That's what we're feeling, that's what we're seeing. And those um, indigenous indicators change. They, they, they don't stay the same. They can change through ceremony. And I'll be uh, touching on that a little bit later. So these were just some of the, I mean, the list is way more extensive, but you know, this is what we're seeing. When, when you talk to elders in the community, you talk to youth, that's the ones I, I love to have conversation with um, because they haven't yet lived that full cycle, whereas our elders are on that last cycle of their life. They've lived through those four quadrants on that medicine wheel, so they've seen all the changes. And these are, we've just highlighted a few. Um, and so one of the things we did through the Indian Resource Council, and some of you may have been involved with this work, is the abandonment of the wells in the province. So we abandoned 180 wells, you know, we reclaimed them. Some of them we're looking at repurposing using geothermal technology, for example. Um, but in some cases, we're removing all that infrastructure because we want to build houses, right? 
we need to use that land for, for something else. Um, and they're a sore eye to look at. I don't think any of you in this room would, would, would argue with that. <laughs> so it affects a lot of the landowners, uh, the value of the land too, when you talk to a, you know, a farmer and you've got all these leases sitting on your property. And because you've got all these leases, that, you just, that just brings the value of your land down by seventy, eighty thousand dollars and and I feel for them. It might even be more now because of inflation, but it, it's really sad. And we want to be part of that, that continuation of restoration and reclamation of those lands because we, you know, we, we have to do our part. It's, it's, it, there's no, I don't, I don't question it personally, and I'll go out there and work. I'll, I'll plant trees or I'll work on these well sites. I'll, I won't stand around and just watch people when I've got too competent and capable, capable hands to, to do that work. So anywhere you see people even throwing out garbage, I'll just go behind and pick up that bag and go throw it in the, you know, I, because uh, I, that's disrespecting our mother for one. You treat the planet how you treat your relative, how you treat your daughter, how you treat your sister or your mother, right? So. This is a very special slide. Jen, do you remember this one? <laughs> I say Jen because um, I teach a course at the University of Calgary, uh, Environmental Issues and Indigenous Communities, and no matter what, this is one, always you know, one of my first slides. Um, I worked in the oil and gas industry for many years, and I was working on a 3D project up in Northeast BC, working with um, elders and monitors before actually the BEAR program even started. We had elders and monitors out on our projects ahead of the CATS and just to you know, take a look, let us know if there's any concerns. And uh, I had um, an elder, Marvin Dejale, out on, on site with his wife who was the monitor. And we get a call, um, we're shutting down your project. What? Yes, we're going to the chief and council now, we're shutting you down. You have destroyed uh, beaver habitat. And we're like, what? Like, what happened? And he goes, I don't, I, I don't want to talk to you on the phone. Come here. So our president said, get on that plane. So I jumped on the plane. We sh you know, put our project on hold. I went there to the elder's house. And they had already developed these pictures. They were so upset. He gave me these pictures. And he said, you need to share this. And this was a life-changing moment for me because um, he said, you have destroyed critical moose habitat. And I said, I thought it was about the, the beaver. He goes, it is about the beaver. He said, you see all of those trees fallen? You know, that's a beaver feeding ground. And you see, that's, that's black poplar. So if you look at the, the trees, you'll see that there's no bark left on them. The moose chewed those all off. And that would have been a female moose, and she would have been calving. And that would have been her medicine to help her calve. And they like they work with the beaver. The beaver also create uh, a great place for them to calve because uh, it keeps, predators don't like to go. You know, we all know they like the straight seismic lines. And so they tend not to go in this area. And he said, you see that little snow in the back area? That's gonna be a seasonal, you know, little pond there. And he said, you, you've completely destroyed this. And what we found out was um, they had flagged this to the 3D cat operator. Don't go through here. And he could have actually avoided it, but he phoned his boss, and the boss phones BC Environment, and they say, yeah, there's lots of beaver, we're not concerned about it. And, you know, right then I realized the depth of the understanding of the ecosystem yeah. and how he just shared so much with me how the, the beaver, you know, were saving or looking after the moose. Uh, I realized I need to, I'm working in the wrong place. I need to work in the environmental side. And that, that's how, you know, that's, this changed my life. And that's how come I started, um, you know, pursuing teaching bear and, and being more involved in the environmental side and, and bringing groups together and starting to really push for knowledge holders, knowledge to be protected, but also to be heard. And we have a long way to go. So I can yeah. give you some, another example. So here we are many years later in 2018, um, I'm on a big national project across the country, big pipeline. I'm working with Pasqua First Nations. We actually um, presented this as a case study at the Global uh, Energy Show. Um, I, I delivered this with John Snow from um, Morley from, um, he's uh, Stony. And 
we, um, we did ceremony. We had, um, we had a, a pipe ceremony. We had a, um, a sweat lodge. Um, we did a feast. And then when we went out to, um, you know, ground truth, we did our tobacco offering. And it's interesting how when you grow up, because growing up for me was like on the land. And my dad taught us, one of the things he taught us that I didn't realize I had that gift until this, this you know, trip was to find springs. I could find the spring in the side of a hill, of a dry hill, I found one. You know, it's like people are like, what? How did you find that? But it just happens. And so after we offered that tobacco, um, the elder we were with, I had this nudge and I said, you know what, I think we need to go over there. I just had this calling. And I knew that I couldn't really say that to this, the scientists and the company because they probably think I was cuckoo. And I, I knew the elder would understand. So the elder says, we need to go over there. And it was <laughs> private land. So we didn't have access to that private land. So thankfully, the, the landowner gave us access. And there was this pond. And it started to rain just lightly. And I could, and I could see the rippling where that whole side of the hill I said this whole side of the hill is a big spring and nobody else could see it everybody else is going I don't know where it is but mark it down the elder says mark it exactly where she, you know she she um, identified it and then all of a sudden northern leopard frogs started jumping everywhere so we were just like oh my gosh like what is going on here so the elder says to me okay you're going to do two things. Go find out about the northern leopard frogs, find the scientist who knows, and find the people who know about this spring. So we, we marked those. We talked to the company. We marked a lot of areas. We found medicines. We found um, you know, some, some sacred sites, fasting sites. It was amazing. And we thought, OK, well, during construction, we'll have our, not only our monitor out there, but we'll also have an archaeologist, because that's so helpful, a great team to work together. And so they're out there during construction. We're, we're told they're not going to go into the side of that hill. And all of a sudden, I get a call from the archaeologist. And she goes, they hit the spring exactly where you pointed it out, where you GPSed it exactly. And it was coming out. Like what we say, there's kind of a difference between hitting a vein and an artery. This was an artery. The water was flowing. So. A couple of things we did was I, I got a hold of species at risk in Edmonton and the expert there told me those frogs because it's August are probably overwintering there they have to look for a spring that's flowing so in order for them to um, you know get to that overwintering they gotta you know dig way down into that mud and get to that spring because that's what keeps them alive over the winter and he said but if you have any noise or you know there's certain uh, decibels of noise that they just cannot take so, you know, we were satisfied that, oh, good, they're not going to go through this area. This is, this is, this is a good thing. Um, so we, we, um, when we shut down the project, like actually it was the chief that did, he phoned and said, look, we, we got to deal with this. You ignored our data. Our, our elders really upset. And when we met with the technical team the next day, you know, I've only ever a have been asked once, how did I know that was a spring? Nobody ever asked me. There was so much, um, e maybe either doubt, maybe? I don't know what it was. I I'm not sure. But I, I asked the team, I said, what were the conditions when you went out there? Because as monitors, we write down all the conditions of you know, that day. And they said, well, it was dry and sunny. I go, well, there you go. You're not going to see the northern leopard frogs for sure, because they were guaranteed. They didn't believe there was any northern leopard frogs there. And, and the hydrologist said we did, they didn't think there was a spring there. So we used our traditional knowledge to identify all these areas. And although it was a, a huge impact and, and it continues to happen, oh, and on the water side, um, I got a hold of the water agency and they said, that's probably an artesian well now. Some guy, some farmer down the road, if he wants to drill a well, it could be contaminated. So make sure they take clean bentonite clay and cover it up. Well, that didn't happen either. But anyways, they patched it up, um, and the water was still flowing out the sides. And right through the winter, we kept checking on it. Um, and it was, it was just really sad for the, the community because the elder weeped, and he saw those frogs. He passed away a couple of years back, and um, sorry. 
he saw those frogs in the sweat lodge. And the Cree people have a very um, sacred story that when the frogs leave, that just starts setting the stage for all of us. And when I think about the teachings um, back home as an Anishinaabe person, you know, the seventh fire, I mean, sorry, the eighth fire, you know, we're in that seventh generation and we have to be on one road. We can't be split. This has got to be one road. We are all on together. And that's the only way it's going to work. And so that's, you know, um, that experience really awakened me to how much work I need to do to help our knowledge holders. And today being mm -hmm. your Scapio is, a, 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 you know, a, you. an honor you. because yeah. all of our, you know, elders are, mm. you know, need that help. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I was honored to help you today with that. Great. So I guess leading into what she's speaking about, these are some of the approaches we're seeing in, in modern day with Indigenous folks working in partnership with our, you know, our industry partners, our, the regulators. So I met with Lori Pusher, the CEO of the AER. We signed an MOU a few months back and we're talking about these joint inspections, allowing our Indigenous people to go out when you have folks in the field coming in from Edmonton or wherever they're situated, Mott, Bonneville. I mean, you've got these, you know, folks in the field everywhere in the province. But give us a call ahead of time. Let us know you're coming into the territory so we could be there with you because we're going to add to those assessments. Um, and we're going to have some things both positive and negative to say. I've seen a lot in my time too, in reference to what Carol's talking about, it's the same teaching I received around the, the leopard frog. It's the same. And it, and it scares me because we're seeing a decline in the population of the leopard frogs too. So we're working with Ducks Unlimited on a project right now to, um, because obviously they're a wetland conservation group. So um, we're going to outline some of the calls to action under these three pillars, under environmental, social, governance. So this is the program I was talking about when I referenced the environmental monitoring and drone program that we piloted at YTC. So now that we've got, you know, 20 licensed pilots in the classroom here, you can see, um, that was an aerial image taken over Peace River um, because we went up there and did some well site um, monitoring. Um, and that was, you know, I, I just love being in a country. Growing up in, in, you know, a province where we have nothing but water, <laughs> it's nice to see hills and mountains, a change of scenery, right? But I always go back home, but I, I love the river. Um, but again, I used to harvest right in just north of there. I'd harvest a lot of my medicines, but the last time I went up there, they were doing some seismic work, they were drilling. And so, you know, it takes away from, you know, the wholeheartedness of why we do what we do and how much can we, uh, you know, determine going forward with respect to, you know, what these leaders are going to do for us in the future. That's the future generation right there. And we're going to actually um, start another cohort next month. We received 55 applications and we only have seats for 20 in Edmonton. So what does that tell you? That's a good problem to have. <laughs> So we can see even beyond this, there's going to be a need to continue on these training programs. And my dear friend Richard Lemaire in the back room is, you know, I've, we talk about, you know, these strategies every day. What can governments do to assist our communities to get them into the workforce? Because they're an untapped labor pool and we have all this knowledge, right? But what I like about Yellowhead Tribal College and nobody talks about this. They're the first institution in Canada, in Canada, in actually Turtle Island, the whole you know, landscape of the US to offer environmental sciences. But people don't, don't give them the accolade for that. And so we, we run it, it's very culture based. So we get them working with the elders in Enoch and they take them out on the land for, to talk about you know, plan identification, control burning, you know, caribou migration patterns, you know, water quality um, and monitoring. So that's one of, you know, that's d near and dear to my heart it's under IRCs and, and, and it's an amazing program. And to see the students develop and grow over time. This is a secondary one that I've been working on for about six years. These are just some of the, the five pillars we focused on. Um, so we're, 
We just had the signage put up. It's part of the Evergreen Learning Innovation Center in Grand Prairie. If you've ever been, um, there's a trail there, interpretive trail. And so we bring in inside education students, close to about 500 a year. Um, we host bio blitz, we, ho we host forestry blitz, we host, you know, a number of, we, we bring in elders onto the land to do some of that interpretation. Um, we're expanding that trail system so that we can bring in more folks to talk about the importance of conservation of wetlands because they're huge carbon sequesters. And I used to harvest in those wetlands, exactly where we put these, these wells in, to monitor the level of the waters. And, and so I go out and do a lot of this work. And that was our strategic planning session with the Indigenous communities in, in the Northwest. So they brought in so much perspective. And we built all that knowledge into our management plan. And now we're working on an app to include all of this information. And it's beautiful and wonderful. And they, their biggest sponsor, I believe, is Kiara. So if anybody here from Kiara, like, kudos, I love you. Not that I don't love anybody else in the room, <laughs> but I love everybody. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's bringing that indigenous science and knowledge to the, right to the forefront. And they're really respecting and honoring that. And if you ever have a chance, go there, because um, actually I taught a bear environmental monitor program there for uh, seven weeks, and it's oh, yeah. incredible, yeah. Yeah. fantastic place to be. So I've, I've got a video that I want to showcase, because I sit on the board of directors for Project Forest, and it's all about rewilding. We do corporate planting events over the summer months, so I go and plant trees. I can do a thousand in a day, seedlings. Um, and so I would challenge anybody of my age or younger to even, you know, look at you know, we're not going to say you got to plant a thousand trees, but I'm just like that. I go off elsewhere and I take a whole bundle of, of seedlings with me and I just go at it and plant while everybody else is going off and doing their thing. This is the Pemina group. Um, we have roughly 12 to 15 sponsors, uh, IKEA. We, we've got some big partners coming on board. Um, every year and it's an amazing project. I'll, I'll let this next slide or video speak to the story. Hopefully it'll, it'll play. Oh, I went back. To, I went, we need to go back and then if you can click on the, the YouTube button because it doesn't allow me to, to do that. Hopefully the audio, we didn't test the audio earlier so we'll see if that, that works. But that video speaks also, Councillor Twin, um, they brought Project Forest on board to look at planting a lot of the, the native species, uh, the, the berries and the shrubs in the community because they saw loss through a lot of development. And the elders were, were, were just, you know, they were talking about how can we rewild, how can we bring back those raspberries or those blueberries or that sweet grass that used to grow in that field. So that's what Project Forest does. They work with Tree Time Services um, to access all the inventory, and then we go out and we plant. And we actually did a tree giving away ceremony with the, the youth in Cold Lake as well. So anywhere we, and, and I get to do a lot of this work because I know a lot of the chiefs in the province. I've been to all 42 nations and worked with them in some capacity. And that's the beauty of, of, of it. I'm not sure if he can, are you controlling it on that end or trying to get back? Awesome. Can't see the forest for the trees? The expression says a lot about the lack of perspective. It has led to so many economic, social, and environmental problems for us all. Project Forest is working to change that. We're planting trees along with food bearing and medicinal plants to restore damaged lands, bring back the forests, and everything they offer. Our partnership with Swan River First Nation is just one example. Swan River First Nation land once supported a rich, productive ecosystem. But the Canadian government discouraged our traditions and incentivized clearing forested areas for commercial use, creating stagnant land with no benefit to us. Combined with the residential school system, which set out to destroy our culture and enforce assimilation and condition our people to live in fear, this led to further destruction of our land and communities. It was a clear case of colonists not seeing the forest for, well, you know. But we've been on a path of self-healing, which includes working with Project Forest to plant over 69,000 seedlings and restore 34 hectares of our non-productive agricultural land. 
As the land transitions back into a productive forest, it will become home to countless species of flora and fauna, each of which is a big part of our survival, both as a people and as a culture. And it has all been done at no cost to us and in full partnership with the nation. At Project Forest, we know that reconciliation, ecological and social, can only move forward ethically and honestly with the full involvement of the people who call this land home. And we are real partners in this. Our nation shared our culture and history, and Project Forest shared their expertise in civic culture and ecosystem rehabilitation. Together, we're growing a permanent forest that will improve air and water, restore animal habitat, capture carbon, and reintroduce our natural foods and medicines. The trees are both symbolically and practically part of taking care of ourselves and our traditional lands because we know that everything is connected and in this connection there is healing for our land and our people. Project Forest wants to work with you just like we've done with Swan River First Nation. Join our community of companies, landowners, conservation groups and First Nations as we grow forests that you can actually see. So yeah, Mike Tofan is really a uh uh, okay, I'm not sure how where that's coming from because I see a different slide on here. Um, if you want to play the second video, I, I've switched over to Siksika Nation Shelter Belt. CBC interviewed um, a couple of folks in the community to talk about this project. It's pretty actually inspiring. And if anybody wants to help us build the shelter belt, we're always looking for people. People from Siksika Nation in southern Alberta say it's getting windier. Living in a valley, you can get those extreme winds, especially when it's coming down a hill. And we have a lot of roads that are going up hills and down hills. They're seeing the impact of climate change on the landscape. It never used to get this windy. And a few years ago, we had a windstorm that took the rooftops off from some houses on the east end. Now the community is turning to a century-old farming practice to combat this new challenge. Soon this bare prairie landscape will include rows of trees, otherwise known as shelter belts. The plants serve as natural wind barriers, shielding homes, livestock and people from bitter prairie winds. Shelter belts aren't new to Alberta. In 1903, the federal government launched a national shelter belt program as part of its bid to attract farmers to the prairies. A landowner can just ask for some free trees and they would come back and plant them and they would really um, increase that kind of land cover. Over a billion seedlings were handed out before the program ended in 2013. Even though the program didn't explicitly exclude First Nations, a technicality prevented farmers living on reserve from receiving free trees. Because they didn't own it the same way, you couldn't say, this is my uh, township and range and my address please send the trees to this area, and then you'd go to town and pick them up and plant them on your land. Mm -hmm. Now, more than 100 years after the program started, that's something that Siksika is changing. The First Nation is planting rows and rows of trees with the help of Edmonton-based nonprofit Project Forest. Together, they decided on 14 species of trees that will survive the area's conditions. We picked to plant hundreds of thousands of Okanese poplar at our Sisika Nation Community Shelter Belt Project because of all the poplars out there, this performs the best mm -hmm. in full sunlight, lots of heat, and limited amounts of moisture. But the reality is not all the trees planted will take root. Sisika has tried to grow trees before and sometimes not super successfully because it's a very challenging climate. Next year, these seedlings will be planted in Sisika Nation. Right now they're small, but in about 10 years, they could look as big as the shelter belts at the University of Saskatchewan School of Agriculture. This is a nice long shelter belt, double rows of Siberian elm, a tree species that they brought from Europe that came over and fit well into this prairie climate. And match the increasingly hot and dry conditions climate change is bringing to the prairies. In addition to blocking wind, they trap snowdrift hydrating soil during the spring melt when crops are beginning to sprout. It's the drier weather that we're seeing too in the summer and the spring, you know, the early melt off, the less rain, it's impacting our grounds. Once the trees are planted, Siksika plans to incorporate edible plants like Saskatoon berries, raspberries, and medicinal plants that have disappeared from the area. Our relationship with all living yeah. beings is as equal. 
So to see them coming back, it's like they're coming back home, is what one elder said. He said in Blackfoot, Aksgut Kaya, they're coming back home. Stephanie Cram, CBC News, Sixika Nation. So yeah, that's what we're kicking off this summer. And we already had a groundbreaking pipe ceremony to, to honor the work that's going to take place. Um, it was, you know, just last year. So um, we're pretty proud of um, what Project Forest is, is, is doing in, in Siksika. So they rely a lot on government funding and, and industry partners to access those dollars um, to come and do this work in the community. So I'm going to touch a little bit on the the social aspect. So um, culture is one of the most powerful tools or vehicles through which, you know, societal values, norms, and, the, you know, uh, when you're transferring that knowledge down to the generations, you have to do it with, um, with, you know, all of creation in mind. And so when we share our stories, that creates a connection. And, and not, there's not one person in the, this room that does not create a story, right? So we rely a lot on creation stories from our elders. That's one of the first things we're taught growing up when we talk about Nanabush or Blue Scap or, you know, there's, there's different, different tribes have different creation stories, right? So we, we have to honor those ways. Um, and doing that creates a long, like long, long lasting relationships. Like the two elders uh, that I was mentored by in Manitoba, Margaret and Jules, Jules Lavalley, they travel the globe to share their, their knowledge and their teachings. Jules passed on from dementia and Margaret is still doing a lot of work at the, um, the Health Sciences Center in Winnipeg, Manitoba. Because I spent 20 years there in my life going through university. And Clinton, our brother from Sturgeon Lake, he's a hoop dancer, so he travels and He's got amazing, he's got an amazing family. His whole family is, you know, the dance troupe of, of, uh, of uh, Sturgeon Lake. This was a, a Touch the Earth camp that I did for eight years in Grand Prairie with the eight to 12 year olds. And we just had a lot of fun. I was teaching them how to sing in my language and they, we were just, like I said, can you guys like bring it down a notch? But they were just so, you can, you can see when <laughs> the laughter and the joy that it brings to children when they learn about our way of life and it just, they're in awe. And that's their aha moment as kids. Because if you've ever read the book, and if you haven't, I'd recommend anybody who has done teaching in this world, Richard Louvre talks about the last child in the woods. That's where I got my inspiration to do that Touch the Earth camp. Um, and it was all volunteer. Right, and, and so I love working with the young ones because their minds are like sponge, they soak up everything and they're gonna believe everything you say to you, but <laughs> so just be careful. When you, so they go tell their parents, you know what, that, so we have to be real. I actually have to say, I, did a, I do talking sticks and I do different activities with youth quite a bit. And one time, um, one of these monitors that I had graduated, um, he's, I was telling him of this story about you know, showing the kids how to make talking <laughs> sticks. He goes, that was you? He goes, my niece brought that home and she made us all sit down and talk. <laughs> I said, good, wasn't that good? And he said, yeah, actually it was. <laughs> and, and, and talking sticks, while you're on it, come in different forms. This is a Cree version using diamond willow that was carved by an artist and that's my spiritual birth name carved right in. This is an Ojibwe version. This is our version, I, I, I like to showcase because when you go, you know, I, have, I don't have a black foot talking stick, um, but this one I made personally because I had this feather since I was eight years old, this hawk feather, and I used the peyote stitch for the, for the color, the beadwork, and I beaded red because red nation closest to my heart, right? And then you've got the white race, the yellow, black, and then of course all the colors in, in between. But when we have that talking stick, it helps us to regulate the, you know, the, the energy in the room. Because when that, the spirit of that animal is there, people respect that. They honor that, that the animal is there to, to keep the energy at bay. So then you don't have people cross-talking. It moderates that, that that conversation. So Hell Experience, I've just recently joined, you know, they, they sent a group of youth to Rome from Stony, like they had a group of youth right across Canada 
to talk about food sovereignty and food security because that's becoming a real issue not only in our communities but globally. Um, and so we're, we're, we're talking about some of the projects um, that we want to launch. We're looking at a vertical farming program at YTC. Um, we're going to look at building a greenhouse in, in Stoney. I know they just signed a big, big agreement with ATCO to build the largest solar farm in, in, in Canada. So that's coming. Um, and so just highlighting some of the work um, and, and taking our knowledge abroad. Um, I spent some time, quite a bit of time in Africa last year. I started out in Ghana and went to Nigeria and then I went over to Rwanda. So my, my whole journey in all of this was to really inspire young women um, and, and, and the families who are harvesting a lot of the, the tea that they were you know, um, growing in their territory. And I said, do you sell to foreign markets? Because I said, I've, I've got a connection. If you want to sell tea in Vancouver or sell tea in wherever, anywhere across Canada, we can help you. So we're working with a company in Vancouver now that's marketing their product and we're, we're saying, can we use like a, a headshot so that they can see who's actually harvesting and growing this tea? So that's what we did. And when I go to Africa, I dress like an African. So they call me their African queen. <laughs> it's like, but I go there and I just, you know, this was the reforestation project we're working on as well. And this is the Kigali Rotary Club. So I'm a, an honorary member of that club. So I go there every year for two, three months. And we just go around in communities and we just help to, to connect people. We help to develop business. We help, there's one, this to the left here, that's a, um, a, a school for young individuals who do anything from carving to painting to beading. And so when tourists go through, um, and they, this is just near Masanzi, near the Congo border, because when I was up there, I wanted to go see the mountain gorilla. So I went to visit the Diane Fossey. Phenomenal. It was on my bucket list, so I had to go. <laughs> but very beautiful landscapes, because there's no GMOs in a lot of these areas. They don't spray. It's all naturally grown. So you have access to fresh mangoes and pineapple every day, and I just miss that. When I come home and I eat a mango or a, uh, you know, um, an avocado, it's like eating plastic, <laughs> right? So uh, they, they spoiled me in Africa, and I love, they're like, they're my sec it's like my second home. If I didn't have my children here, because I'm a single mom, and they were already grown up and gone, I'd be living in Africa right now. That's where my heart kind of wants to go. Um, but I showcase that because it shows some of the work that we're, we're doing and taking our knowledge globally too to other markets where they need, our indigenous brothers, their need our help too. So it's nice to give back. Um, uh, so this future youth and technology, I'm working with um, Red Deer Polytechnic and I just started up a tech company in Calgary. And we, we were approached by a film company to work on a big blockbuster film. So I'm moving into the tech sector. I don't know how long I'll be with IRC, so I hope nobody says anything to my CEO that, hey, did you know that? <laughs> <laughs> but so we're gonna take up some office space downtown here and we're gonna really get into the, the workings of robotics, artificial intelligence, uh, coding, 3D printing. So I've developed a six week program in partnership with Red Deer College to host uh, students from Montana First Nation as a pilot. And we're gonna introduce them to careers in robotics, artificial, 3D coding, and they're gonna learn how to build a drone from scratch too. So we brought Google and NASA on as partners as well because we know those are the big guys with the dollars. So they can donate some of the, the capital supplies that we require for that six weeks. Um, and I had a phone call about four months ago from a student. I was running the indigenous program in, I started out in Grand Prairie and I ran it for 11 years there. And I got a call from a student from my second cohort. And he said, Winona, he says, you'll never guess where I'm working. And I said, because he, he came through our six week program and it's an, these are exposure camps. So exposing them to all these different careers in the industry. So he said, he's, you know, when he called, he was calling from Australia and he said, I'm working with James Cameron on the Avatar film, right? So he's an animator. And I'm like, wow, I, I couldn't believe it. But I said to him, I said, I'm gonna pay for your ticket to come and do a presentation to our youth this summer because they need to see all this inspiring work that you're doing to say that they can be there too doing this work. But he's my favorite director and I love that film. That's my favorite because it talks about 
you know, the, the life um, that, we, that, we, that we're living, you know, spatial or not, right? We need to continue to, to fight and we'll fight to our last breath if we have to, to protect um, our planet. So through this youth and technology program, we're hoping that they're gonna get on board with um, careers in a lot of these tech industries. And so we've, we're, we're, we're making a lot of strides. We're gonna partner up with a, an indigenous owned tech company in Seattle as well. We're going to ResCon in Vegas in March. We're gonna set up booths at the Global Energy Show and the Forward Summit coming up. So we're getting it out there and we want to get our indigenous folks on, but we've been living in the shadows too long. And there's no reason we can't pull these youth who are living in this electric bubble to come out of that bubble and learn a little bit about technology and get paid $30 an hour to fly a drone instead of playing it in, on you know, these, these gaming devices, right? In Halo, for example. So yeah, I, I have these conversations with youth all the time. They're fun to collaborate with. <laughs> um, on the governance side, of course, um, you've heard a lot about Truth and Reconciliation, the United Nations Declaration. Um, so having an awareness. So if you, you haven't done any homework, and, and one of the things I, I'll never forget I used to work for a pipeline company. We had the CEO come in and meet with the chiefs in Enoch at the, the River Cree. And one of the chiefs asked my CEO, a non-Indigenous company, what do you know about Treaty 6? Right on the spot. And he, had, he didn't have an answer or a clue. And that's embarrassing. Because he looked at me and I said, no, no, they're looking at you to answer that. And so what... I learned from that and he learned from that was you do your research. So they could, they could put you on the spot. They could ask you, well, what do you know about Sturgeon Lake or what do you know about Coal Lake? You want to do business with us, what do you know? So I highly recommend you do a little bit of that. There's information everywhere you can find um, on the internet. I don't always trust sources that I find. I talk to people because they're going to tell you the truth. Um, so, and, and that you're not going to be able to get your projects approved without that social license. If you haven't done your diligence and duty to consult with Indigenous pe people across this land, Turtle Island, you're not going to make any improvements or any progress. It has to be. That's law now. Duty, con duty to consult is law now. It hasn't been tested in court yet, but it's, it's going to happen. And, and, and you've seen all the, course, the, the case law that's coming forward with respect to Indigenous people on you know, what, when it comes to land rights and surface rights and, right, uh, resource management. So we need to be, I think, doing our part and educating ourselves. It's not up to us to educate you because we've, we've adopted your ways and your, your sciences and your bodies of knowledge. Now, I think we have to kind of meet halfway so that we can start blending and start braiding. Um, and if any of you haven't read the book, I'd highly recommend Braiding Sweetgrass. I know a few of you in the room have. You, ma you make reference to some of the quotes in the book, but I read this thing probably four or five times now. I just read it over and over and over because I want some things to stick. And sometimes I have to read it three or four times for it to stick. And, <laughs> and there's a story in there about me. Yes, yes. So yes. I have, to, I have to say, I was at um, the Menominee Nation in the U.S. Uh, at a wisdom conference back in 2009. And I was doing a presentation and she was sitting beside me and I had no one to watch my daughter. So I'm like, Robin, can you watch my daughter while I go up on stage? And she said, sure, but as long as you give me an interview later for a project I'm doing. I didn't know it was the book. And I said, of course, take yes. care of my girl while I'm up there. So that's how that little story happened. <laughs> so. Uh, this, this is referencing the earlier um, story I was sharing about the, um, the springs and the, the, frog, um, the frogs. And when we had to do our report, this was a really sensitive issue because the elders clearly did not want us to write a report from a Western science perspective. They wanted us to, to write our report from that Indigenous worldview. So, so part of it is that, you know, when we were writing that report, um, we did it all videos. So the, the nation has, you know, 
um, late uh, Elder Lindsay Sear on all of these videos, talking about the impacts, talking about the concerns out on the land, and we reference just maybe a, a statement that he made in, in that whole conversation, but we reference where they can find that information in the film. So they have all of, all of that data, which is so important for communities to hold that data. So if you're working with communities, make sure that they're the ones that are the keepers of that information, you know, because that's where it should be and that's where it belongs. And, uh, the, you know, for us, this was such an important step in starting to write it from our perspective and it was just a real joy to do it. Yeah, secondary holders, that's what we, how we reference it sometimes in our language. But, so the, I'm going to pick up speed a bit because I know we've only got a few minutes. We want to give you time to transition and I think they're going to have to break down this room to get ready for the banquet. So one of the initiatives that we, I, and I reference this already with the Innisfail group, this is the group I'm talking about where we, we hosted an energy summit. We brought in a hydrogen seal, fuel cell vehicle into the arena. We brought solar, wind, and everything to showcase. So we're gonna take this concept to the indigenous communities. I got funding from the Minister of Energy to do this with all 42 nations. So they're gonna learn a lot about all the clean and green renewable technologies that exist today in Alberta. So we're talking geothermal, wind, biomass, right? Uh, solar and greenhouses so then they can make those informed decisions for themselves because when you ask them now you want to go in on a project well they don't have a clue what this technology does or the, the impacts that it might have on on their their land so the last um, uh, energy summit that we're hosting because we did all four aspects of the we've, we've done the Grand Prairie Friendship Center St. Paul we did Medicine Hat and they invite community members to come out and we talk about what these communities would like to see in terms of the energy projects going forward. So I'm going to Fort Mac next Tuesday. That's our last summit. So we're going to meet community members, industry, governments, you name it. There's close to 200 people registered for that session. And my focus is talking on uh, retrofitting for net zero. So talking to folks about what you could do, like if you want to retrofit your home, because I went through a retrofit before I moved to, to Calgary and Grand Prairie. So that just touches a little bit on the work that I'm doing under the Energy Futures Lab. And there's a lot of hubs and networks that we're all a part of, I think, in some to some degree, or have a connection to. But my question is whether or not these hubs are talking. So it's important that we get better at communicating our efforts too. And a program I'm very proud of is the Bear Environmental Monitor Program. Um, I was actually blessed in um, 2023 to receive the Eco Impact mm, Award. Nice. <laughs> wow. Yeah, thank you. And, and through this work, you know, I, I had to sit down and calculate because I had to sit down and figure out how many monitors I've actually trained since, since 2006. Considering we only like to do 12 to, you know, 15 yeah. students max, you don't want people falling through the cracks. You want them to walk out the door being able to monitor. And uh, just over 600, and if I heard the calculation, I have trained 12% of the entire Eco Canada. Wow. wow. Yeah, That's awesome. monitors. That's awesome. So, <laughs> thank you. Yes. And um, and I want to thank my family because they were the ones that sacrificed for me gone six to eight weeks at a time in remote communities, driving all night, 12-hour mm -hmm. drives, no cell service. You know, it was tough. And, mm -hmm. but like you said, it was my purpose. It yeah. was something I had to do. And right now I'm, I'm working with the Takakoop Cree Nation. We're, we're doing a program and I'm so proud of this one because it's the first time that all of my students are already in jobs within the nation. And I've been waiting for this. Yeah, because usually what happens is I'll train, you know, 12 monitors in the community and then, you know, maybe the lands office isn't familiar yes. with what monitoring, what they do out there, the consultation is, and nobody's really familiar in that, you know, the people that are doing the work. And so this time, this guy's a water treatment Mm -hmm. you know, guy, and he's out there, he's learning to be a monitor. So we've got this diverse team um, that are in jobs that are gonna work for their nation. And this was actually the first delivery in Alberta that I was so blessed to do at the Big Stone Cree Nation in 2006. And this was our first pilot of the BEAR program. Um, and then the next one 
is we have a, a guest here from Listigouche, <laughs> and this was one that we did down in 2008 in Listigouche in the Mi'kmaq community, um, and it was actually for a wind power project. So that was really exciting. Um, but the next, you know, I have to say, having worked in the Big Stone Cree Nation from 2006 and then going back and at the graduation in 2006, one of the little girls graduated later in one of these, you know, <laughs> programs. And it was really neat to see it, it generationally happening, um, that we're seeing all these monitors. And, you know, we go to the tough places. If anybody's ever been to the Slave Lake Class II landfill, I'll, I just want to share this story because one of our monitors said, can bears or wildlife come in here? Because it's quite a contaminated area. And uh, the guy said, no, we got cameras, we got everything, there's no bears coming in here. And he goes, well, come on, I'm going to show you. And showed the tracks of a bear. Oh, <gasps> we'll have to look in the cameras. I don't know when that happened. So again, <laughs> just, you know, we were looking at that as going, this isn't good, this, this bear coming to such a contaminated area. We need to, you know, protect that. And, and so that was a big issue for us. But, but you know, the part that I love, I mean, the training's there, the curriculum's there, but there's a part of it that isn't there, and that's working with the knowledge holders. That's all through, um, you know, working with, with the, the elders in the community, uh, their guiding the students to mm -hmm. learn that traditional knowledge and to really um, understand what it is that they need to continuously learn in order to come, become better and better at it. Because you know, there's some young monitors that take the program and they are very techy mm -hmm. and they're great at report writing, but they don't know the land. So, you know, when they go out with an elder, they've, they can do all the note taking. And so, you know, it's also really important not to ever make the assumption that every indigenous person knows what's out there. You know, like there's, I, I work with a young uh, indigenous man whose um, mother was a 60s scoop and he doesn't have his identity. He doesn't know where he's from, but he identifies and he knows who he is. So as he starts to learn that and he starts to build that awareness, we always need our knowledge holders. So um, we need access to them. Like I still do, even as, as a knowledge holder, I still need my elders. And I, even when I get old, I'll still say I need my elders, yeah. you know, no matter what. So it's something that's really important part of the monitor program. Awesome. So these next si slides are just going to talk about, basically here are some perspectives on how Indigenous and non-Indigenous people can work together in a new, pro a new approach to ESG when it comes to regeneration, conservation, um, and management of our territories. But it has to be done jointly. Um, and I think, you know, with that Indigenous voice, the connection, that, that guidance is always going to be offered in spirit. So I've highlighted six points for you here. Trusting in that Indigenous leadership, I think that's where some of the, uh, you know, the, the resistance is sometimes. You, you, people assume that we don't trust and we have to start somewhere to rebuild that and recognizing that that knowledge exists. Um, and it's always going to be at the forefront, focusing on solutions, dedicating that work, um, I guess, jointly and creating those, those plans and continuing to learn on both sides. I'm, I'm an avid learner. I could probably spend the rest of my life going to school if I, if I could afford to live that way, but um, <laughs> studying history, studying the lay of the land, studying plants, it's, it's endless. Um, and examining how col colonization has disrupted Indigenous people's livelihoods, um, that's important to acknowledge. Um, sometimes people walk into our communities that know more about our communities than we do. I, the Chinese woman we're, we're partnering with in China, she, when I asked her about the treaties, I asked her about UNDRIP, I asked her about Alexander, because that's the nation we're working with to bring that wisdom water technology, she knew more than I did. I'm like, wow. Not saying that I know everything, but wow, I thought I knew something. <laughs> and she just, yeah, but they do their research. Um, so keeping up to date with some of those indigenous uh, protocols and, and what the communities are doing, keep a pulse, keep your eye you know, on, on what's happening. There's a lot of people you can talk to, I mean, amongst each other that have had that experience working in our community. So this is our commitment towards, you know, um, looking at a, a world, you know, and, and it having 
all its struggles and where we're going. I don't know that we can change what's happening, but any small thing that we do, whether it's recycling a, a plastic bottle or, you know, or d taking the C train to work, anything that you can do, um, it's going to meaningfully contribute to our, our footprint and what we leave behind is very important too for our children and their, our children's children. I'm sure you're all concerned with the same things we're concerned about as Indigenous people. Um, so what we want to do is we want to ask you to, because we want you to stretch, it's our last little exercise, <laughs> um, and just to talk amongst yourselves, like what are your calls to action going forward? Do the five minute exercise that we did in the beginning. And, if, and I'm sure you all have something in, in heart. If not in mind, it'll be in heart. <laughs>